Good morning, folks. I hope you enjoyed our first Kiss Kid animation of the seminar series. We're stepping things up here. And I am pleased to welcome you to the IBM Kiss Kid Live quantum seminar series dedicated to you, the research and academic quantum communities. Now, in just a minute, we'll be thrilled to roll out this week's seminar with Ray Simmons. Uh, I'm so glad you could join us on time. And we'd like to begin the seminar with giving everyone just about a minute or two to tune into the live stream. And uh, we like to begin also by finding out where's everybody tuning in from today. I'm here from New York. Um, we'll see where Ray is from in just a minute. And you can reply to this question in the same comment chat box on YouTube where you can ask questions live of Ray during this talk and during the seminar. That chat box is located somewhere on your right, left, above or below. I'm sure you can find it. So feel free to reply in that box so we can uh, get a sense of where folks are and you can practice asking questions, discussing and keeping things interactive here. I'd also like to share with you that next week, I'm very excited for the Kiska Global Summer School. Uh, we've, we're kicking that off and hopefully we'll see many of you folks there as well. So with that, I think it's time to begin. This seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time and will be hosted on this Kiskid YouTube channel. You can always go back, watch and catch up on anything you missed, but you can only ask questions live here and now during the seminar. Today, I have the special pleasure and privilege of hosting Ray Simmons from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST Boulder, Colorado. Uh, Dr. Ray Simmons received his bachelor in 1995 and PhD in 2002 in physics from the University of California, Berkeley, with Seamus Davis developing a helium-3 superfluid quantum interference device. Uh, from 2002 to 2004, Ray was an NRC postdoc fellow with Dr. John Martinez at NIST Boulder, developing two coupled superconducting quantum phase qubits in the very early days. Ray joined the NIST faculty as a physicist in 2004 and was a project leader from 2012 to 2014. Since then, Ray has moved back to the bench as an experimental physicist in the Advanced Microwave Photonics Group in the Applied Physics Division. And we had the pleasure to have several folks from the Advanced Microwave Group here on the seminar. Uh, Ray's bio and career achievements are exceedingly long, so I won't be able to get through all of them, but I'll mention that he uh, discovered the two-level system TLS defects in Joseph tunnel barriers with superconducting qubits back in 2003 with, with colleagues. He demonstrated, Ray demonstrated coupled phase qubits with sim by a simultaneous state measurements in 2005, um, microwave to optical quantum transducers in collaboration with NIST Jill in 2014, and parametric coupling of superconducting qubits, which is what we'll hear about today, resonators and electromechanics which Ray's been working on since 2008 to now. And with that, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the seminar, Ray. How are you today? Hi, doing good. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. I'm glad we got to run into each other at March meeting and really enjoyed all the talks from your group. Uh, where are you tuning in from today, Ray? So I'm in uh, wonderful San Francisco, actually. I'm not in Boulder. It's a lot cooler here. Uh, <laughs> Oh, well, we're really glad you could um, make the time and join us for the seminar. Um, so, Ray, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, and the stage is yours. And folks, feel free to uh, post questions as Ray goes along in the chat box, and I'll try to bring these up to Ray. Okay, great. And uh, hopefully you can see my slides there, and I've got a laser pointer. So I'm going to talk to you today about engineering parametric interactions between superconducting circuits. And there's been a lot of different uh, experiments that we've worked on at NIST, and I don't have time to go through all of them, uh, ranging. They, they, we have a sort of a theme in our group about parametric interactions, whether it's between mechanical elements, linear oscillators, or nonlinear oscillators. And I encourage you to go see some of the other Kiskit seminars from our group members um that talk about some of the other work that we've been doing in our group i also wanted to highlight some other seminars uh from will oliver about if you want to hear more about superconducting gates and also michael hatridge is working on parametric interactions 
And Dave Schuster, who you need to get to give a kiss to get seminar, uh, he is also doing a lot of great things with parametric interactions, um, as well as uh, other people from IBM who have worked on this topic. So I wanted to start off showing a simple pendulum, which was kind of a, it's a kind of a theme uh, in my talk. And it, it's, it kind of encompass, encompasses a lot of physics, basically, of having a nonlinear oscillator. Um, and most people are familiar with swinging on a swing and using parametric amplification to uh, pump up your amplitude. And if you just change the, your, the length of the pendulum by moving your legs around, uh, you can actually pump up your amplitude fairly easily. And so most people are used to that sort of parametric amplification, but there are other things that parametric interactions can do. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in this talk. So I'm going to start off giving a brief introduction to superconducting qubits. Then I'll go through some of uh, early parametric interactions and some history. I'll talk about our parametric architecture and then two of our experiments and future ideas. So our superconducting qubit of choice, which is what most people have are using these days is a nonlinear oscillator. And if you take a simple linear electrical oscillator that just has an uh, inductor and capacitor in parallel, uh, you have one sort of frequency that you can drive that system. And if you try to put photons in that system, you'll just run up those quantum levels. You'll just keep adding more and more and more. So having some nonlinearity in your oscillator is very helpful. Uh, and just like a pendulum, when a pendulum's amplitude gets higher, its frequency decreases. If we take a superconducting circuit and add a Josephson junction in parallel as our inductor, our nonlinear inductor, the frequency will actually decrease as the function of the amplitude or as the amplitude goes up. So what that means is I can put in a single photon at one frequency, but to add a second photon, I need to use a lower frequency and so on and so forth. And that makes it very convenient uh, to store quantum information because we can put in a single photon, which is sort of like having one excitation and that gives you your one state. And if you have no energy in the system, then you're in your ground state. So those are your two computational states that you're going to be using for doing quantum information. And this circuit's called the transmon, which is what a lot of people are using these days. Now you can also make that transmon flux tunable or frequency tunable by adding two Josephson junctions in parallel and adding a magnetic flux through this loop. That makes the inductance uh, depend on flux and it will increase as you increase flux in the loop and that decreases the frequency. And as you're going to see soon, that it's it's really important to be able to tune these circuits around. This is very important. And tuning frequency is a very useful uh, strategy. So basic measurements, if you take a superconducting qubit and couple it to a linear resonator, uh, then the state of that qubit uh, can change the frequency of that resonator, depending on uh, whether you're in the one state or the zero state, you just get a different frequency. And you can read that out with microwaves by sending them into the refrigerator and out of the refrigerator. So in order to do uh, quantum gates, uh, then you need to have interactions between these two different systems. And you can do that statically by adding uh, capacitors between the circuits or inductors. Or you can make it tunable by adding some sort of a tunable element that has a Josephson junction in it. And again, I use this analogy with a uh, coupled pendula. If you have two pendulums and they share a string here and they're on resonance with each other, meaning they have the same resonant frequency or the same length, then they can oscillate and they can share energy back and forth and exchange energy. And here you see the oscillation of one pendulum starting off large and then transferring its energy to the other oscillator. So this is sort of the basic component that you need in order to start um, 
creating quantum gates. Now, if the two oscillators are on resonance, they can exchange ener energy very easily, but parametric interactions are very useful if you want to deal with oscillators that do not have the same frequency. So if, they, if they're far detuned from each other, they essentially don't share energy because there's an energy gap between them and they need to make up that energy if they want to share energy at all. So if you uh, connect each oscillator to some component that can change its frequency and each one can be modulated by adding uh, a parametric drive, you basically have the elements for parametric coupling now. So if you add a pump that can pump this tunable parameter I call phi and change the frequency of these two oscillators, that allows you to get a coupling that's proportional to how much you modulate those oscillators. So if you need 100 megahertz, say, of coupling strength, you really only need to modulate by about 100 megahertz. And if you pump this system at the difference frequency between the oscillators, then you're essentially making up for the energy that you require in order to get these oscillators to exchange uh, energy or provide a swap operation. And in that case, uh, as you drive that system, the pump will absorb photons, will give photons that are absorbed by the system to create energy exchange between those two oscillators. If you pump at the sum frequency, then you can generate energy in both systems and pump them up. That's an amplification uh, process. And both of these processes are very useful uh, for, for uh, exchanging or sharing quantum information or in order to help read out systems. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So let's move on to a little bit of a historical background. There has been a ton of work on tunable couplers since the beginning of superconducting qubits. There was a lot of work on those things, but it was in 2006 when parametric coupling really sort of uh, was thought up by Patrice Berthe and Nakamura and uh, Franco Nori. And the idea, this was motivated because they had these early flux qubits were really hard to optimize and their frequencies were very hard to target. So they often didn't come out. If you want to do a coupled flux qubit experiment, it was very hard to get them to be on resonance in the first place. So uh, they, they realized that it would be much easier to use some sort of a parametric coupling element. And at that time, they, they essentially used another RF squid as their coupling element. And that allowed them to do some of the first uh, coupled parametric coupled qubit experiments, which were really interesting. Um, after that time, though, it sort of disappeared. Um, and not a lot of people actually worked on that for, for some time. Uh, I got interested in this work with coupling linear resonators uh, when I was collaborating with Lin Tien, who was looking at coupling a linear oscillator, electrical oscillator, to a mechanical oscillator and using parametric coupling uh, to do that. And since I was looking at tunable couplers at the time, I realized, oh, well, then I could use uh, a tunable coupler as a parametric element between uh, superconducting resonators. And at NIST, uh, my colleague, Joe Montado was working on parametric amplification with uh, coplanar waveguides. And we realized that we could probably couple the different modes that are inside a single uh, coplanar waveguide by just modulating a squid at the end of it. And we added a qubit uh, to that circuit to allow it to be a single photon uh, source and detector. And as I showed before, uh, if you have this resonator where its uh, frequency can be modulated, in this case, it has two modes in it that can be modulated. Um, if you pump the flux, then you should be able to generate a parametric coupling between those resonators. So we, we were able to observe that back in 2011, and we saw uh, mode splitting for those two modes. 
And we also were able to use our qubit to put a photon, single photon in one of those resonant modes and swap that back and forth coherently. Um, so we also got a very nice write-up from uh, Nakamura at that time, uh, which was really helpful to kind of spur on this, this concept of swapping uh, different photons that had different colors because they were at totally different frequencies, about four gigahertz apart. So that was really exciting. Uh, we went on to do more with this using single photons, uh, putting one photon in and two photons and things like that. Um, and our concept at that time was, this is kind of like doing microwave quantum optics, but instead of having a laser table with, with lots of components on it, you can put all that on to a chip. Um, and after that, we decided, hey, we should be doing these things with uh, qubits and cavities also. And so we did some early experiments where we coupled a resonator and a qubit parametrically and saw mode splittings and even saw quite high coupling rates and uh, the absorption of two photons by the pump to actually generate these interactions as well. Uh, we also moved on and did some work with 3D cavities. Uh, and just showed that we could do parametric coupling between 3D, 3D uh, modes that are linear modes, uh, but everything worked in that sort of system all, as well. Um, so since that time, we have decided that we, we thought we could come up with a parametric architecture that sort of combines all these uh, unique features and take a system of multiple qubits and a resonator, combine them all, and generate all-to-all -all coupling between uh, multiple qubits and a resonator for doing readout all in one system. So that's what we've been working towards uh, since that time. And the nice thing about a system like this is you get tunable coupling with high on-off ratios. Um, as I'm going to show you, there are ways to protect the elements and eliminate crosstalk and decoherence. Um, when you have strong coupling and fast interactions, you can get high fidelity operations. You can do everything with all microwave control and it reduces wire count, increases connectivity and improve, you can improve your measurements with high efficiency this way also. So let's start talking about the first experiment now. The first experiment we worked on now was coupled through a parametric coupler. And we chose to incorporate a DC squid, uh, which acts as a tunable inductor, with two transmon qubits. And we read them out multiplex with this just a single cavity over here. Uh, and the idea is that because the coupler now only takes a small participation ratio with the transmons, typically a tunable transmons that just has two junction squid in it has quite a large modulation here that you, you can change the frequency quite a bit. In our case, because we're sharing a squid along with a single junction, the modulation is quite small. It only needs to be about 100 megahertz in order for us to get about 100 megahertz of coupling. And when we apply pumps at difference frequencies, we have our coupled qubit uh, level diagram here. And just by picking the difference frequency between different levels, we can generate swap operations that just allow you to exchange energy between those different levels that have the same number of photons. So it's really, uh, it's really versatile in that we can, we not, we can apply single microwaves to individual qubits to just move up the ladder. And then we can apply parametric interactions to move between these different levels. So here's a picture of the circuit. We have a coplanar waveguide cavity here uh, that does the readout. We have our left qubit and our right qubit. These are the large capacitor plates. They share uh, a DC squid that's shown here that has two junctions in it. And then we have two small junctions that represent the main qubit junctions. Now, as we tune flux, we can see that the cavity modulates a very small amount. It picks up a little bit of modulation. Most of the modulation is both with the left and the right qubit. 
And we have reasonable coherence times for these circuits. And if we want to look at how well these parametric interactions work, uh, one of the gates that's really useful is using a controlled uh, Z gate. And in this case, we just need to introduce a phase of minus one to the EE state. And one really easy way to do that is if you're sitting in this state, if you make a rotation, if you take yourself up to the GF and back down again, you'll, uh, you'll get a minus one. Or if you go to the GF back to the EE, you'll also get a minus one. So all you need to do is apply a parametric rotation that brings you away from this state and back again to do that gate. So we can demonstrate those swap operations by preparing ourselves in the GF state. And then if you turn on a parametric pump at the difference frequency between these two levels, you can see that you get these swap operations. And when the, when the system is in the EE state, it's not in the GF state. And when it's in the GF state, it's not in the, EF, the EE state. So you can see these oscillations are uh, out of phase with each other. Ray, a uh, quick question on yeah. on the um, individuality of the qubits. Uh, let's say when all the parametric drives are off, this is a little bit about the on-off ratio or just how isolated are the two qubits or is there some static interaction in this design that, that is always on that's like an always on ZZ that you might have to worry about uh, versus how all individually separated are the two qubits yeah so i'm going to i'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute um, this design is set up in a special way that it tries to cancel any static couplings which i'm going to get into uh, mm -hmm. there is some zz that's left over and i'm going to talk about that problem for now i'm just sort of trying to get a feel for uh the, the parametric interactions, but I'm going to get back to this point. Great. Thanks. And folks, feel free to post questions in the comment chat box. So in demonstrating these oscillations, if I turn, if I turn the power up, you can see that the swap operations increase in speed. And here you see that we can essentially move from the EE to the GF and back again in about 10 nanoseconds. So this is happening around 100 megahertz. So these, these are quite fast, quite strong interactions. Um, and in order to just test that we can actually do a controlled Z gate, um, if you put a pi pulse on the left qubit and then perform a Ramsey operation where you put the right qubit in the plane and see if this uh, CZ gate can actually flip that interaction around with your minus one. Uh, that's one way to tell that this thing works. So when there is no CZ interaction, you see the Ramsey oscillation has a particular phase. And when you add a minus one, it flips that oscillation over. So you effectively flip that minus one, uh, that state as you, as you should. Uh, so now let's talk a little bit about ZZ coupling. So that showed that we can get these easy, uh, these parametric interactions, but there is another issue that you have to be aware of, and that is how are these qubits actually coupled? So in our case, what we've done is because transmons are quite big and they have uh, large capacitor plates, we've actually used that as an advantage here. So typically, uh, sometimes you don't want to have stray capacitive couplings. In this case, we've tried to make that a feature of the design. So each one of these uh, transmons actually couples to each other capacitively, but they are also coupled through this inductive coupling. And it turns out it's the sum of these two couplings that, uh, that is important. And because they have opposite signs in the, in the squid coupler, you're sharing currents together. So each current is shared together, which kind of gives you a positive coupling. Whereas here you're sharing differences of, charge between the plates. And so you could imagine you have a negative sign for that coupling. And it turns out that if you engineer things properly, there is a point at which uh, these two, the inductive coupling and the capacitive coupling will cancel each other. And if you are, have a strong coupling and you have the qubits detuned, you can get something called ZZ coupling where the state of each qubit uh, 
depends on the other qubit. And that's shown in this spectroscopic scan here. Um, if I'm both qubits are in the ground state and I'm exciting the right qubit, I get one transition. But if the left qubit is excited, I actually get a second transition. And we can measure that by applying a pi pulse to the left qubit and then doing a spectroscopic drive on the right qubit. And you can see that what you're doing is you're probing this transition frequency or this transition frequency. And ideally, they should be the same. It, it, they shouldn't care about each other. So if we do that spectroscopic scan, you can see that you have two spectroscopic lines and they are, have some separation from each other. You can see that that separation shrinks to some amount and then grows again. Now, ideally, these two lines should cross. That would tell you that you have no ZZ coupling. But in fact, in our design, you actually have a, some residual ZZ coupling. There is a cancellation point where that capacitive inductive coupling cancels, but we have residual uh, ZZ coupling that's left over. And this is really because one way to think about this is you have two normal modes that are sharing currents. And although we'd like to think of the left qubit as the left qubit and the right qubit as the right qubit, it turns out that say when the right qubit is actually resonating, some of, it, some of its current will actually pass through the left qubit's Josephson junctions. And so that means that you're sharing current uh, within that Josephson junction, which gives you a nonlinear coupling. And that's basically what's left over. Um, so there is a way to deal with that problem, but uh, which is what I'm going to talk about next. But the issue really is that CZ coupling can very can just destroy. If you want to try to operate both qubits uh, independently, they just get get uh, completely destroyed. So if you try Maybe. to do gates, yeah. Before I let you get to that section, which I think we can't wait to hear about, a uh, quick question from the audience because uh, I think we're, I don't want to get us too far away from the question point, which was about the. F state and the two qubit gate fidelity. Um, the question from James, thanks James for the question is, uh, you know, is T1 worse in the F state as, as it typically it often ha happens to be? And how does that impact the fidelity of the two qubit gate? Okay, that is true. The, uh, as you go up the ladder, the probability of dropping down from whatever your relaxation time is, uh, that, that We may have a little buffering issue here with Ray, so we'll give Ray just a minute to... Are you back with us, Ray? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Okay. Good. Thanks. Let me, let me make sure... Thanks for tuning in from, from the conference. Uh, so we're, we're going to make the internet connection work as well as possible here. Can you hear me fine now? Sorry about that. Uh, yep. So... If, if the higher levels definitely decay faster, our goal is if we can go extremely fast, then we can avoid that problem. Of course, it's much better to have the highest coherence times you can. But if the gate is relatively fast, then it's unlikely you'll lose that, that, uh, that photon while you're in the GF state, one of the higher levels. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Okay, so let me... Let me move on now and, and talk about, uh, uh, again, that this ZZ coupling is really not great. You really don't want your qubits to be correlated with each other when, you're, uh, when they're not supposed to be talking to each other. And if you do randomized benchmarking, just single qubit benchmarking on each qubit, uh, you can see you can get nice benchmarking. But if you're trying to do it simultaneously and you have these correlations, you basically uh, when each qubit depends on the other qubit, it's a very bad thing, and it it will destroy your ability to do uh, uh, gates properly. So if we take a look at this system now, and we look at what happens when we apply our parametric drive. So I showed some time domain behavior, but now let's take a look at the spectrum. So if you start off in the GG state and you apply your parametric pump, uh, you see a transition here that is essentially the, the uh, exchanging of a single photon. So that's this splitting here. If I apply, uh, if I start in the EG state now 
and apply my parametric pump, I see these other transitions. So here is the GF transition, and here is the FG transition. And this difference, the fact that these two uh, spectros spectroscopic lines are not on top of each other, that is another indication of the ZZ coupling that we're seeing. And what's interesting, though, is that when you apply a drive near this frequency, um, you, you generate this splitting. And in fact, that actually pushes this level, it pushes on the EE level to a point where there are two places where that ZZ coupling cancels. Once these two spectroscopic lines overlap, that's telling you that now those two transition frequencies are the same. So we can use a parametric trick here. It's a dispersive, it's not a, you're not exchanging photons now, but you're using the parametric drive to actually push the energy levels around. And this is a very clever way of being able to uh, reduce and remove ZZ coupling. So it turns out if you increase, depending on where you put the pump, if you increase the amplitude, you'll see that you can push this crossing point uh, to a different location. And it turns out what you'd really like to do is apply this uh, dispersive drive far away from these transitions where you don't want photon swapping and just turn up the power in a way that you can find out where that ZZ coupling cancels. So here I'm showing that we can uh, cancel up to six megahertz of ZZ coupling and find that cancellation point. And if you want to be really sure that you've actually canceled that, uh, cancel that carefully, you can use, again, use a Ramsey uh, interference process where you basically look to see if there's a phase, uh, phase shift on the right qubit uh, after pi pulsing the left qubit. And um, so that can, that can tell us exactly, uh, can you guys hear me fine? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Uh, that can tell you exactly where, uh, sorry, my, my NIST network keeps trying to connect me, which I don't want to do. <laughs> um, this can tell us where uh, the, there's a, this extra phase shift that's coming from this easy coupling, and we can find exactly where that cancels at zero, zero phase shift. Um, and so... And right at this cancellation point, uh, we can really fine tune this by using the Ramsey interference. Now, here we've made the, uh, the uh, time difference between these two Ramsey pulses as being one microsecond. Uh, we can also do that at various other uh, time delays, and they all cancel at the exact same place. So this is showing that we can get a very, very accurate uh, cancellation uh, ZZ coupling. That's very nice. Uh, so, so you can you can do this extremely accurately and uh, and and be very sure that that the interactions are completely off. Uh, up to our about a, our experimental limit of looking at our Ramses is something like uh, down to a kilohertz level um, to tell you that you really have no interactions between these qubits. Um, when, when there's uh, no other parametric drives on. Okay, so what that allows you to do now is uh, before cancellation, you see that everything was getting canceled. Uh, we have no simultaneous benchmarking, it doesn't work. And after we've canceled that ZZ coupling, now we can do simultaneous benchmarking. So this is gonna allow us to continue now you know, I'm wondering if I can uh, get rid of this by just yeah, saying that's good. yes to it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so hopefully that'll go away. Uh, so now once we do uh, nice simultaneous benchmarking, we can, uh, we can do simultaneous benchmarking uh, very nicely between our two qubits and everything is working just fine, and we can move on to doing our parametric gates. Uh, 
So we can start optimizing our benchmarking for our CZ gate, which I showed roughly before. Uh, and we're going to do that using these. We use Han function pulses, which are just these cosine pulses because it's very easy to shape them. Um, and what we can do is we can do two qubit benchmarking and change our uh, the frequency at Thanks for bearing with us, guys. Let's give Ray's uh, Wi-Fi connection here just a minute to come back to us. And meanwhile, this is a great time to discuss and post questions in the chat. Okay, Ray, I see. I think you're back with us. Let's see. Did you did you see this slide already? Um, yes, this is good. I think it was just a couple of seconds. Okay. So we we basically use simultaneous benchmarking as a way to uh, optimize these are all the parameters that we're using for our cz gate which is the frequency of our parametric pump the amplitude of that pump and the rise and fall time of that uh pulse shape and we can use that to do some optimization to make sure we're doing the gate properly um, in addition when we apply these pulses they tend to shift the frequencies of the qubits a little bit but you can use a virtual z rotation or, or a frame rotation for each of those qubits so you can optimize those things. And once we do that, uh, we can work on, we can apply our cancellation tone at the same time as we're doing all these parametrics. So we add a second parametric tone that does the CZ gate as I showed before, and we can do some very nice uh, benchmarking of that, uh, of that process. And What's nice is because this coupling is tunable and we can we can vary the time at which we do this gate. And if we take a very long time to do the gate, you can see that the fidelity essentially follows what you would expect for, uh, for the coherence of the qubit. And in this case, the qubit coherence is not that great. It's only about 15 microseconds. Um, and if you're going slow, that's basically what's limiting you. So we heard that question earlier about higher levels and energy decay. And that sort of shows you if you go too slow, then yes, you, your gate fidelity will be limited um, by that decay. But as you speed up, uh, things, things do pretty well. They start to come off this line, but we still do a pretty good job and we can get up to about 99.4% fidelity with 60 nanoseconds, which is, which is pretty nice. And if you compare that to some of the other parametric gates that have been out there, uh, I think we're doing quite well in terms of how fast the gate is and, and how high the fidelity is uh, for that gate. So one thing that's interesting is we realized... Uh, <clears throat> Could you comment on, and I guess the curves do seem really nice, but um, one thing that you might not immediately see here is potential for leakage as you get to a very short um, as you get, I guess, further on the left. Yes, the yes, that's true. So there are definitely things that, uh, that happen as you start to pump harder and harder, then you can start to get leakage. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can get other parametric processes that show up that are unwanted. So there is a point at which you start to, uh, things start to fall, fall apart. Now it might be that, so we tried some different things. We tried different shaped pulses. We also can do a little bit of uh, drag, which is the way we can uh, shape the pulse can affect how much leakage you get. And so that definitely helps. And so there are probably more things we can do to try to help uh, uh, keep this, keep the process clean while we're going faster. But eventually stuff will definitely start to go wrong at very high powers. And, and uh, so, is heating uh, ever an issue? Because in some of these parametric processes, sometimes you end up heating the qubits or perhaps. Uh, we, tend, we tend to do most of our operations on chip and we try to remove all the, all the filtering uh, that we have at low temperature is, uh, doesn't have a lot of loss except for uh, say microwaves, they might act like an attenuator, but we don't, they don't attenuate so heavily that we heat the fridge during these processes. We typically don't heat the fridge actually. 
Gotcha. So you don't see a lot of, uh, yeah, you don't see extrinsic heating. And then you're not also maybe seeing some of this heating that you might see parametrically activated heating that's more quantum based uh, in some sense that, that sometimes folks see, maybe more so with cavities and populating, um, you know, use photons uh, in some modes that, you know, lead to some detrimental effects. Yes, I mean, part of that is because one of the things that's different about our, our uh, technique, a lot of, there are other techniques that have used, um, usually use uh, for parametric coupling, a third transmon that's capacitively coupled. Here, because we've incorporated the squid directly into the circuits, they're extremely strongly coupled uh, between the two transmons. Um, and that has... The, the tricky part about that is you have very, very strong coupling. So without doing this cancellation trick, but the way we've arranged the circuits, um, we would have very strong extraneous uh, couplings that we wouldn't like. But because we've learned how to cancel those couplings, the actual parametric coupling strength is very, very strong. So we don't actually have to pump that hard in order to get very uh, high coupling, parametric coupling rates. Does that make sense? I see. Yeah, you're saying you don't actually have to pump that hard, which is which is a real nice advantage. And does um, how uh, how stable is the tuning? Let's say is it is it really finicky and sensitive uh, to any fluctuations? You know, maybe your room temperature electronics, or does it seem to be quite quite more stable in terms of time? Um, in other words, you know, does the gate fidelity drift um, on the scale of a cup of a few hours, or maybe couple of days. So it's, it's fairly stable. I think the thing that's less stable are the qubits themselves. Um, and I don't, I don't have any plots here showing stability over time, but uh, the T1 times of the qubits can jump around, which can affect the fidelity. If they re remain, you know, over short periods of time, if, if they don't jump too much, that the, the gate actually, the fidelity stays pretty constant. Um, Great. And so, so this, this was a demonstration showing uh, this parametric controlled Z gate where you had to do, uh, you had to move to one of the energy levels and come back again. But we realized that when we controlled the ZZ coupling to cancel the ZZ coupling, that indeed we could just do a uh, cancellation tone now that now performs the ZZ gate. So in fact, if you just turn on uh, if you just change that cancellation tone, you'll actually, you can perform a ZZ gate. And that, ac that can actually be done with even higher fidelity, as I show here. And uh, that's this brown line now. During that experimental run, we only had about nine microseconds T1, so that, that moved us up here. But what's neat is we, we have this cancellation tone that we've applied, and then we, just, we can simply turn it up a little bit for a certain amount of time and then turn it back to zero. And that can actually give us a little bit more improvement in gate fidelity, and it also improves the speed. Um, and now we can do 99.5% in about 30 nanoseconds. And if you compare that to some of the other gates that are out there that typically use uh, flux shift pulses with their tunable couplers, um, we're actually doing pretty well. Um, and if we can improve our coherence times for these qubits, we probably can drop, uh, drop, even though we're not quite coherence limited here, we're doing pretty well, we can probably push our gate fidelity above 99.9%. Um, and I, I like to highlight that your the IBM result here, uh, Stellix paper is very nice. They use this really interesting way of uh, taking their bus coupler, which is sort of a third transmon. And depending on where you put that transmon, you can also get cancellation of ZZ coupling and it's flux tunable. And if you just turn up that ZZ coupling and turn it off, kind of like what we did parametrically, but do it with a shift flux shift pulse, you can get very high gate fidelities in very short times. So I, I really like that paper. Um, so yeah, if there's if there's no more questions for the two qubit gate work, I was going to move on to our second experiment. Yeah, and folks, feel free to post questions in the chat. Sorry, we're having a little spam issue today, where we're going to figure out how to get rid of that. 
uh, but uh, don't don't hesitate to post questions in the chat. And if I miss them, just bring them back up. Uh, so Ray, I'll, I'll let you keep going. Okay. So I, so I'll say that there's probably a lot more uh, optimization. Uh, there's there's other ways of. What's nice is uh, you can think of this this parametric gate now as a microwave pulse, and that's typically what we use to. Uh, to operate single qubit gates. And now your coupled qubit gate is also a microwave pulse. So you can try to use a lot of the same strategies and tricks and optimization techniques uh, that you use for single qubit gates and use that on coupled qubit gates. And typically single qubit gate fidelities are much higher. And hopefully we can push these microwave gates uh, to have uh, uh, commensurate uh, fidelities above 99.9%. So now let me switch gears a little bit and talk about how you can use parametric interactions uh, to in a cavity QED type system. So now we're going to use uh, the, uh, an, a resonator. We add our resonator before the cavity was just doing readout and it wasn't parametrically included. Now it will be in parametrically included in the circuit. So we have our left qubit, our right qubit, and we have an output cavity an output mode that talks to a feed line, and they're all going to be parametrically coupled. So you can not only do parametric gates between the left and the right qubits, but you can also do a parametric dispersive readout of the left and the right qubit through this uh, cavity. And so we've taken, we take the circuit we had before, but now we add a lumped element cavity uh, to the middle of it. They all share our squid coupler that we've shown before. And now we do this same trick where we, we now play with the, the, the cross coupling between these different capacitors so that at a particular flux uh, in this squid, uh, all of these static uh, couplings should cancel each other. And at that point, ideally, there would be no interactions between all these uh, elements until you turn on a parametric drive. Otherwise, they basically are completely decoupled. So if we do spectroscopy by looking at the cavity mode, so here I'm showing the cavity mode tuning with flux, and you can use that cavity mode to just do regular dispersive readout. So when there is static coupling, you will be able to see the two qubits, which is what I show here. Um, and at a particular flux, there's a point where these, this uh, spectroscopy sort of disappears for the right and the left qubit. And this is showing, this is already indicating that that dispersive coupling from static uh, sources is actually disappearing and that those systems are becoming isolated. And what's great is in this system, we have our cavity mode up at nine gigahertz and our two qubits are down here near six. And you can look at the energy that it, of that cavity mode. And if you wanna connect the cavity mode to either qubit, you just simply add a parametric pump that makes up for that energy difference. So we could swap uh, photons that are in the E state, the F state, or the H state simply by changing the pump frequency. And you can do that simultaneously on both qubits. So now you can uh, uh, interact with both qubits simply by picking the pump frequencies. So what we've what we realize is that uh, it, you can have these static dispersive shifts from static coupling, but if you apply a dispersive uh, uh, a parametric pump dispersively, you can also get a parametric dispersive shift. And now what you're doing is the pump is actually being detuned from the difference frequency. So if you're at the difference frequency, you're going to get swaps, you're going to get energy exchange, but if you're detuned from that you're actually gonna get dispersive shifts. And I already showed those dispersive shifts. That was how we canceled the ZZ coupling between two qubits, but we can use those dispersive shifts between a qubit and a cavity now and also do readout. And that parametric coupling again, just depends on how much those two frequencies of the, the cavity and the qubit modulate with flux. And what's really cool is that you basically get the same type of dispersive cavity QED interactions that you would see, typically this axis here would be detuning that you have to, when you fabricate the qubits, you actually have to move their frequency 
or tune the frequency of the of the system with flux. In this case, we're just showing that the parametric pump frequency can change. And we can show that the dispersive shift can be negative or positive. So we have this new parametric straddling regime uh, that that is coming just from the fact that you can pump in a particular with particular frequency. You can also extend that to all the other higher order terms that deal with the higher levels. And you can see that you get a little bit richer looking uh, uh, plot here of what, what the expected dispersive shifts are. And what's interesting is that that's, uh, this is going to allow you to actually measure the higher levels, which I'm going to show you now. So if you take a look at the cavity frequency I showed you and you apply your parametric pump and the qubits in the ground state, and here we're just looking at the right qubit for now, you see that when you hit the difference frequency, you see a splitting here, and that's showing you that's where you would get energy swaps. And if you prepare yourself in the EE state, you will see uh, the next transition now where you're exchanging energy with the E state. But it turns out that if you're detuned from those splittings, you actually get a dispersive shift. Um, and those dispersive shifts even go up if you go up to the higher energy levels. So you can take a look at all the higher energy levels as well. And so now if I'm just plotting the uh, dispersive shifts from the uh, first level, and I apply a parametric pump at different frequencies, you see that we get this characteristic, characteristic dispersive shift curve. And notice I have parked myself at a place where the static coupling is essentially zero, that I have no dispersive shift. So I'm plotting the total chi here, but I've parked myself at a static flux where there's no real dispersive shift. And as I turn up the pump, you see the dispersive shifts get bigger and bigger with pump amplitude. Uh, we've also found some interesting features uh, that goes beyond the basic theory. This is this is a two-photon process and a fourth-order dispersive shifts theory, and that was uh, some work that was done with uh, in collaboration in collaboration with Archana Kamal, and that is an archive paper which soon, I believe, soon will be published. Um, but that that is really interesting that there are other interactions here that we could explore later. But for now, I'm going to keep going and, and sort of use these for doing qubit readout. If you park yourself at a different flux offset, you can see that you can start off with a static coupling. So here's near uh, zero pump power. And so now I've parked myself at a place where I do have static coupling and I have a dispersive shift. But what's interesting is I can apply this positive dispersive shift to actually cancel that negative shift and eventually remove dispersive shifts between the qubit and the cavity. This is an interesting feature. Uh, we've also shown that all, this, this basically matches what you would expect uh, from theory, knowing the strength of the dispersive coupling that you can get and the different amplitudes uh, and sizes of dispersive shift agree with what you'd expect. We can also do this on the left qubit. So here I show that the left qubit is, is showing the same type of behavior. Um, and here what, we, what we're showing is that if you track the static dispersive shift only now, so now we're only looking at the static dispersive shift. This is kind of like when we were watch, measuring the ZZ coupling for the two qubits. In this case, we're looking at the static dispersive shift as a function of uh, flux or qubit frequency, and you see that it starts off large and it comes down to a minimum. And in this case, we can get far below a megahertz. <clears throat> so at a particular, that particular cancellation flux, you really don't have much interaction between uh, the qubit and the cavity. And one way you can see that, um, you can uh, apply photons, you can add dephasing to the qubit by adding photons to the cavity, and you can measure that dephasing rate. And by measuring that dephasing rate, you can also pull out that static chi and, and check that it matches what you would expect from just looking at the spectral shift of the cavity. And we can do this on the left qubit as well. Um, and it turns out that these two uh, cancellation points uh, line up fairly well. Um, 
The other thing we can do is take a look in this system now at how sensitive is it to flux noise. So there's uh, a couple papers here. This one is Britton Plords, and this is a new paper by the IBM group, you guys, uh, talking about adding squids, uh, asymmetric squids. So this, this paper talks about adding, making your uh, transmon have an asymmetric squid for flux tuning, and that's these uh, colored plots here. So if two, both junctions are equal, you get very, very strong tuning. <clears throat> and as the ratio of the junctions changes, so you get a junction that has 15 times the critical current in one of the junctions, you get much less modulation. Uh, and then this uh, IBM work talks about uh, uh, adding a squid just kind of like we did, but also making it asymmetric and you can get fairly weak modulations. Uh, and we're showing now the two modulations. Here I've scaled the left qubit up to the right qubit frequency. But basically, you, you, you can see here that we have very, very weak modulation of our qubit frequencies, but we can still get very strong parametric coupling strengths. And the dephasing that you get from flux noise uh, is basically proportional to the slope of this curve. If you have a very small slope and you have noise jiggling your flux, then you get uh, a lot less dephasing than if you have a fully tunable transmon. And so here, if you plot the flux, uh, I mean the slope here, the, how much the, the frequency changes with flux, uh, these dashed lines are what you would get by making the squid even asymmetric, which we haven't done. But you can see that we get into these very uh, weak um, range of flux sensitivity. And we can probably, by changing our operation point, we can get even lower, um, or we could make the squids asymmetric as well. Uh, in our system, if we look at the dephasing time, it turns out that we had quite a bit of dephasing. And unfortunately, as I just showed, the slope of that curve is very, very weak. So most of the dephasing we're getting is from a very high amount of flux noise. It's about 10 times larger than it should be. Uh, typically, people see one to two microfinot per root hertz, and we're at more like 14, which wasn't that great for this sample. Um, but we can we can basically characterize that, and that gives this background uh, T2 curve. Now, what's cool is we can show you that we did indeed cancel uh, this this coupling of the qubits to the cavity, and we can do that again by adding photons photon shot noise to the cavity, we see that the dephasing time of the qubit is actually uh, gets really bad when you're away from cancellation, but it essentially doesn't affect the, the, tr the transmons too badly uh, when you're at that cancellation point. Um, so this is, this is one of, I mean, flux noise is one dephasing mechanism that you don't want to have. And we have uh, we have accounted for that by making the slopes really weak. So the flux sensitivity is really weak, although this sample had quite a lot of flux noise. But we've also managed to eliminate uh, dephasing that we could get from photons that end up in the cavity. And you can see this is quite high to have half a photon, one photon, or two photons is a massive amount of photons in your readout cavity. That readout cavity should have uh, less than a percent. Um, so Although it may not look like it here, it is we've very, very strongly uh, protected ourselves from that sort of dephasing mechanism. So now let me let me, uh, let me ask what what are what can we do here? We can apply can we apply two parametric pulses simultaneously and get these dispersive shifts at the same time? And can we independently tune them? And the answer is yes. So. One thing that's really nice with our system is if you pick distinct dispersive shifts for each of those uh, qubits with the cavity, you can read out all, you can multiplex read out all the different states for this system, which is really nice. Um, and what else can you do with this ability? Well, we can use that also to do parity readout. And you can also use those things. If, if you can't distinguish two different states, you can also generate entanglement. And this is also useful for error correction. And here I show where if you make each of the dispersive shifts from the left and the right qubit equal, you can be in a situation where 
when you're when you place your readout cavity frequency here, you can't tell the difference between which qubit is excited. And you can tell the difference between whether the qubit's not excited, both the qubits are not excited or both qubits are excited, but you can't tell the difference between which qubit is excited. So this allows you, this is a way that you can do a uh, parity readout and if, and you can also generate entanglement this way. Um, and what's nice is th these types of experiments have been done in the past, but it typically required people to actually, I think they were done in 3D cavities and they actually had to warm up, move the pin around the coupling pin in order to really get these dispersive shifts to be the same. It was very hard to do. Uh, whereas in our case, all we have to do is pick the right difference frequency and pump amplitudes, and we can tune it up in situ really nicely. And one thing that would be really difficult to do um, with a static coupled system is actually make it so that you can read out the odd states where one of the dispersive shifts is positive and the other one is equally but equal but negative. And that's very difficult to do in a static system, but here we can just tune that up. A question, uh, Ray. Does does this? And thanks, James, for your question. Uh, does the dispersive shift from the cavity, in this case, then turn on the interaction between the qubits? The ZZ back on. So in this case, the um, the the ZZ coupling for the two qubits. That's a really good question. Um, that stray coupling that's here is, is around the same order of what we saw before. So we can compensate by applying another cancellation tone. So what's great is every time you add another parametric tone, it is a little bit more complicated, but the processes add up. So if we have a cancellation tone on that's canceling the ZZ between the two qubits, you can apply a second tone that will apply these dispersive shifts to the cavity um if you add other tones uh sometimes you have to mo mo you have to modify the 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 other cancellation tones so you do have to keep up with with uh you have to make sure that all tones provide the dispersive shifts you want but it is possible to do those things thanks Ray. and he, yeah and here here in this case we're just showing two tones for the qubit in the cavity, but it, it works as well for the ZZ between the qubits. Um, <clears throat> so, and I'm almost done here. We're running out of time, but uh, so what, el what else can we do with a system like this? Um, so here I show uh, a paper by Alexander Blaze Group where they talked about if you had a, a cavity that was tunable with flux so that could, it could be parametrically pumped, and you have two transmons. Here, they're statically coupled to this tunable cavity. Um, if you can make their dispersive shifts um, to be equal, as I showed before, then you can get this sort of parity readout. And by pumping this system really, really hard, you can actually make it bifurcate and sort of amplify the parity of the uh, of the state of the qubits. And so this is something we could naturally do in our system. But this tuning of dispersive shifts would be quite easy to do, and we can do it in situ. The other thing that was a really interesting paper by Irfan Siddiqui's group was to take a transmon qubit and couple it directly to a parametric amplifier, basically a tunable resonator here. Um, and this was this was a was a great paper, and it and it it allows you to try to make a highly efficient measurement because if you can amplify the readout right on chip, right next to the qubit, um, then you won't lose any of the measurement photons at all. Uh, one thing that's a little bit tricky though is because the qubit is strongly coupled to this amplifier, when you pump up the amplifier, it immediately starts doing things to the qubit. You can force the qubit to move up into higher levels and things like that. And one thing about our system that we created is that uh, those extra couplings can be turned on and off. So it's it's what we'd like to see is if there's a way we can amplify our signal, um, but maintain protection for the qubit. So that's something we're looking to in the future. Um, so, so that's it for the main part of my talk. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what, where are we going in the future? We've been working hard now to uh, 
model our designs a little bit more uh, seriously and try to really tune up these designs so we can get all these cancelings uh, to work very, very nicely. And part of that is going to be reducing some of those extra ZZ couplings. Um, and so I wanted to highlight uh, my graduate student, uh, Zachary Parrott, who gave a, uh, a talk at the March meeting uh, about using Kiskit Metal and Pi EPR method, which we love. And we are using that extensively to try to help design our new circuits. And although the March meeting's over, you can actually go and see Zach's talk. He put it on YouTube for everyone. So I, I encourage you to go and take a look at that talk. I, and, I can second that. That's a really good talk and great work. And glad, glad uh, Kiska Metal is helping you guys. Yeah, so w this is this is really great. I mean, my my original designs I did with fast cap, fast Henry and lumped element models. And uh, it's nice to have a full uh, a full HFSS simulation to really see where currents are flowing and things are, how things are really behaving. Um, so just to highlight a little bit about s some of the, uh, you know, here's here's this circuit where we had two qubits uh, with the cavity readout. And uh, here Zach has sort of tuned things up to sort of see how his model matches some of the experimental data. And we're able to capture uh, the strength of that ZZ coupling that we saw that extra two megahertz fairly fairly well. So, so these tools are really helping us and I think they're gonna help uh, speed up our design iteration product uh, process. Um, he also has done some modeling on the second circuit I showed where we have three elements uh, parametrically coupled. And here he's showing um, the static couplings. This is kind of, again, like the, it's the cross curve leftovers and how close do these cross curve leftovers get close, you know, how close to zero do we get and how well do these uh, cancellation points line up? Um, so yeah, I, I encourage you to go and see his talk. The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, this second circuit that I showed has also been used uh, with our collaborators from BBN Technologies um, and uh, from Leonardo Rosani's group. And we have been able to do uh, a trade-off free entanglement stabilization between the two qubits using parametric interactions. Um, and it would be great if, if, if you get them on to, to give a kiss kit seminar about this work. But there are really interesting things that we can do with stabilization using parametric interactions. And a system like this just provides uh, a lot of flexibility and uh, unique capabilities. So the last thing I want to talk about is just say a little bit about where are we going in the future and what do we want to do? And there was a paper, you know, some years ago now by Chris Monroe, where he, he took his trapped ion system, uh, which has all to all coupling between its qubits. And he took uh, one of your processors and ran, uh, ran some some algorithms on there showing that it was really nice to have these all to all couplings that more connections were important. And at that time he said, Hey, this is a really great thing. And it's really unique to trapped ion community. And, um, you know, and, and the idea is now that if, if he can take these, uh, these, a small ion trap with a small number of qubits that have all to all coupling and find ways to link those things up, link these clusters up that he can get a much, much larger, larger system. Um, so here is, here is some ideas that he has had. And he said it was unique to sort of the ion trap system. Well, I'd like to say that the superconductors can do this too. And uh, it would be really great to move along a similar line of thought where you take these small clusters of qubits that are parametrically coupled and then find ways to parametrically couple those clusters and build up their system um, and have quite a lot of flexibility and, uh, and be able to do quite a lot of things. So the idea here is that once you've created the, the chip, when you've put all your superconducting circuits down in, in the proper way, you have a system that's, that's fixed. You don't have to mess with it anymore. And basically you do all your programming through your microwave pulses. It's, it's a software programmable quantum simulator. And, uh, that's highly flexible. 
And I've always been envious of the ion groups because they've been able to do these sorts of things. And I'm really excited to be able to start working towards uh, more complex systems and being able to do these things and when, and just, you know, make one chip and do a thousand things with the chip. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, my group. Um, most of the work I showed you here was done by, uh, by Jin and Taiwan. Um, Jin has now moved on to uh, Bleximo, a company in Berkeley, superconducting uh, quantum computing company that's starting up. And Taiwan has moved to Ron, Rob Sholkoff's company in um, quantum circuits. And I'd also like to highlight our collaborators. Uh, Kurt Jacobs has done some work on qubit measurement with us. Archana Kamal and Luke Govia and Leonardo Rosani. And uh, this is a, sort of an old picture of our group. We have quite a few other people, um, but uh, including Zach, who I mentioned, but he's not he's not here in the picture. And I also like to thank the other PIs in the group, uh, Joan Montado and John Tufel, who have all contributed to the work that you've seen today. Thank you. Thank you, Ray, for the wonderful talk and congratulations on the many very nice results and outlook. Um, I'll only take here one or two questions. Uh, so folks, feel free to post final questions. We get uh, near the ends here since we're, we are a little short on time. Um, one quick question. Could you do leakage detection, as in detect a leakage event without measuring the qubit state? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think that's an interesting thing to think about. I mean, clearly we can uh, we can look at higher levels with these dispersive interactions, but trying to find a way to see leakage without actually knowing the state of the qubit, I, I think that would probably be possible, uh, depending on how you set up uh, your measurements. You just need to know that something got out of the manifold, but not know uh, exactly the state uh, of the of the actual system. That's an interesting idea. Great, thank you. Um, could the circuit be tiled easily or any other scaling issues? So that's something we're working on right now. I think I think one thing right now that's tricky is, you know, in the way we've done it, we, we're not using any crossovers and everything is done in a planar arrangement. So for a small number of qubits, uh, four or five maybe, it, it's probably not too hard to get the capacitive couplings the way we like them. I think to make a larger system, we probably need to go into the third dimension and use crossovers or some other uh, interesting means to be able to uh, design those capacitances the way we like. But I think, the, and then from there you can, you know, tile those systems around and find ways to couple them together. So learning how to, to couple the different tiles together is is another interesting uh, avenue of research. And we're, we're thinking about all those things right now. And uh, in that vein, um, can you tell us more about the potential, you know, thoughts or cons how restrictive are things with, um, maybe to make an analogy to the cross resonance type of gate where you end up having a lot of uh, constraints on frequency collisions and you have to be very careful that uh, you know, your, your qubit frequencies are within a certain band so that you don't have the, you know, zero to over two transition hitting this. And uh, you also have to worry about spectator qubits that are neighboring and so on. Um, you know, how, how can we maybe understand the collision, the frequency collisions that you have to worry about here? Are they quite tight or a little more open? So, so this is another great, great, uh, comment, um, this is also, I mentioned the trap ion community. They also have a similar issue that if you put more and more ions in one trap, the number of motional modes, because you use the motion as sort of a bus to, cu to couple things, uh, it starts to get really complicated. And that is true here also as well. As you add more qubits, you start to get more of these transitions and you really, you don't want to have too many, you can't have the difference transitions all end up on top of each other. Otherwise, you'll start performing interactions you don't want. So figuring out uh, how you do your frequency crowding uh, management is, is definitely a tricky task. And using 
bands of certain frequencies that are separated from each other uh, is important. And also there's there's other things to worry about like multi-photon. I showed uh, briefly at the very beginning that you can also absorb two photons at half the pump frequency that can cause interactions. Mm. So that sort of thing, uh, especially if you're pumping really hard, you can start to add extra dispersive shifts and interactions uh, that you don't want. So that is definitely a tricky problem. And uh, that's something that also has to be uh, worked on. And we're thinking about those things. Got it. And uh, folks, I know that there are a few more questions in the chat. So thank you for posting those. Um, but seeing as we're you know, over 15 minutes here on the, on the seminar today, I think we'll uh, let you, Ray, share any final uh, comments or words you'd like to, uh, to leave us with. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I'm very excited about uh, parametric interactions and, and, and the work we've been work doing here. And I, I'm really excited to see where this field goes. I think uh, I really like what IBM is doing in terms of giving these lectures and, and getting the word out and uh, supporting people who are trying to learn how to do uh, any kind of quantum simulation or programming on all your platforms. I, I think it's really exciting. And, I, and I'm really, I really want to see where this field goes. I think there's a, a lot of impressive stuff that's being done all over the world. Thank you, thank you. And folks, if you if you share that, if if you're enjoying these seminars and lectures, put a plus one in the chat so that uh, so that we know. And uh, with that, Ray, congratulations on the really nice results to you and the team. And uh, we're, we're very pleased that you gave this talk and congratulations on the nice results. Uh, folks, uh, thank you very much for tuning in today. Uh, we will, with this, uh, you can, by the way, go back and rewatch the talk. It was, there was quite a lot that Ray shared with us. So the, the video will stay recorded and you can go back and uh, rewatch it. You can only ask questions live during the seminar. And with that, uh, folks, we'll see you next Friday at noon Eastern time uh, with Alexei Gorshkov. Great. Thank you, Ray. Thank, thank you so much, Zaklo, for uh, for inviting me. This was really fun. I'm glad to hear. Same here. Take care.